Well, welcome everyone. I know we had some people just trying to join, so I'm glad that you made it. I can see you in the attendees list. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for our local history talk with Stephen Gilbar. Uh, it's about literary history in Montecito. Uh, my name is Kim Crail, and um, this program is being hosted by the Montecito Library, also in partnership with the Montecito Association History Committee. And we'd like to give special thanks to the Montecito, Montecito History Committee Chair, Trish Davis, for her help with our local history series. So our presenter this evening is author Stephen Gilbar, who is a 43-year resident of Montecito, and he's written more than 20 books. His most recent, which was published in 2021, is Published and Perished, Santa Barbara Writers Remembered, which includes some of the writers you will hear about tonight. If you have questions, please save them for the end, and we hope we have time for Steve to answer some of them. And please join me in giving Steve a warm Zoom welcome this evening. Welcome. Now I'm gonna assume that you have all been vaccinated. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna re re remove my mask, okay? You can do the same. <clears throat> now it was my original intention to give an hour's talk about writers with the Montecito connection. I didn't want to say Montecito writers because, as it turns out, none of them were actually born here. Some lived here for a short time. Others made it their home late in life. But all, I hope, are interesting. As I was collecting authors, I realized that there were a great many more than I had expected. So I broke the talk into two parts. Last month, the writers included Sue Grafton, Annie Flagg, T.C. Boyle, Ariana Ben Stasinopoulos Huffington, Dory Carter, and others, well known and obscure. Today, there's a new list of authors, perhaps less well known as the earlier ones, but I think you'll find it interesting. Oh, one other thing. If you've come here expecting deep literary criticism of the works of our writers, you know, structuralism, postmodernism, semiotics, et cetera, you know, the English major stuff, you will be disappointed. No academic lit crit here. This will be rather a lighthearted look at some writers who have called Montecito home. I've limited the talk to men and women who are principally writers, thus eliminating the many celebrity autobiographies and how-to authors, charming as some may be. So no Oprah, no Megan, no Rob Lowe, Ellen DeGeneres, Carol Burnett, Dennis Miller, Tipper Gore, well, the list goes on. Now, some Montecetans have written very fine books to tell a story of survival over disease or through war. For example, Karen Fennell and Beverly Hyman Fee. As fine as these books are, they are not, I quote, literature. Again, whatever that may be exactly. And two of our greatest food writers called Montecito Home, and one still does. Julia Child, she lived in Bonnie Mead and then Casa Dorinda. And happily still with us is the irrepressible Betty Fussell, also at Casa Dorinda. I've also not included journalists as such. Oh, and Montecito has a connection. I can get this to make it happen. There we go. <clears throat> With the teaching of creative writing, the annual Santa Barbara Writers Conference needs to be mentioned. Started by Barnaby and Mary Conrad in 1972, the first two were held at Kate School, but then it moved to the Miramar Hotel. 
where it continued until its demise, the hotel that is, the conference, it's still going strong. One of its longtime and influential workshop leaders was Shelley Lungenkopf. Well, first, let me look at this as one of the very early ones uh, announcing the Rutgers Conference. And uh, man, that's a uh, who's who of writers, isn't it? And notice they spelled uh, Kurt Vonnegut's first name wrong, it should be a K, but hey, so what? Anyway, I was going to tell you that um, one of the longtime and influential workshop leaders was Shelley Lowenkopf, who was a Montecetan. He lived actually near me on Danielson Road in Baja, Montecito, with his wife, Anne, who was also a much revered writing instructor. Two longtime stalwarts of the conference are Diane Rabb. She lives on Sycamore Canyon Road, and the ever enthusiastic Susan Gobranson, long a resident of Feather Hill Road, book reviewer, columnist, and cheerleader for Santa Barbara authors. Excuse me. Okay, let's begin. Jean Harpinist, her novel. A Brief History of the Flood tells a story that is often told by writers. You know, the manic depressive mother, the drunken father, and the children caught up in the chaos. But few authors do it with the grace and, may I say, generosity of harpinists, whose writing has been described by one critic as dreamlike in its lyricism. Like the young narrator Lillian, Harfinus grew up in the 1960s in a large family in a small town in rural Minnesota. She left home after high school for a series of secretarial jobs before finding a way into a marketing career that led her to New York. Eventually, she resigned a position as a product manager for a consumer goods company to pursue a business degree at New York University. Following graduation, she moved to LA, where she worked in account management for two major ad agencies. Now, how did a successful businesswoman become a novelist? What happened this way? In 1990, she was home on medical leave from her ad agency, recovering from what had been diagnosed as chronic mononucleosis. After two years of being nearly bedridden, she began, she later wrote, to have hours and occasionally entire days of feeling well enough to do something when one morning UCLA extension catalog slipped from the stack of mail I was reading in bed. Idly, I flipped through it and, just as idly, I reached for the phone and registered for a course called writing from the inner self. This was a whim, she said, but I had to get out of the house. I had to produce something and I had exactly nothing to lose. This was a low cost, low threat, no credit course. Besides, how difficult could it be to write from the inner self? Well, after years of living in Manhattan and even more years of living in Los Angeles, the first assignment of my first writing course spun me around and pushed me back toward rural Minnesota. The structure of a brief history is larger, largely a result, she says, of my first ever writing assignment. There is at least a kernel in each story. Memories can never be fact. I've stolen these from my remembered childhood to write my fiction. It's a method that set these stories firmly in a landscape, both human and geographic, of my childhood. In 1994, after a decade in LA, she and her husband bought their house on Poso Lupo Lane. It had been built by Kenny Loggins in the late 1970s. She workshopped her early drafts in the Saturday morning writers workshops here at the Montecito Library 
run by Shelley Lowenkamp and Leonard Turney. She said, by the time they finished having their way with my work, I was sparking with ideas and bolstered by the reminder that there's more than one right way to tell a story. What more can you ask from a workshop? After many years of gestation, when she felt it was finished, she was fortunate to have it bought and published in 2002 by one of the most prestigious publishers in New York, Alfred A. Knopf. To rave reviews from thousands of appreciative readers. If you haven't read this book, it's wonderful. Okay, let's move on to our next writer. This is Leslie Zemeckis. Now, when she was Leslie Harter, she came to Los Angeles in the 1990s to become an actor. With her beauty and sex appeal, she was soon getting parts in movies and TV series. But her, her roles changed in 2001 when she married the acclaimed director, Robert Zemeckis. Other talents were able to bloom including writing, producing, acting, and <laughs> making babies, three within the next six years. Now, this is how she became a writer. Soon after her marriage, she created a one-woman burlesque show for herself called Star. She's back and mistresser than ever. Now, this is... Uh, she, she, she does have a penchant for a uh, leopard skin prince, she said. That's uh, Robert Zemeckis. Prince. Okay. So, there we go. Um, in this one woman burlesque show she created, it was Star with two A's. She's back and mistresser than ever. The star is, in Zemeckis' own words, a quote, gold digging slut, hungry for sex and happy to be a mistress. And she performed it in various LA clubs, including a six week residence at the Conger Room in 2005. She later produced a mockumentary based on the character that starred Carrie Fisher and Jeffrey Tambor. Now, curiously at the time, though she knew of the word burlesque, she did not actually know much about it. So she started researching it, became so fascinated with the subject that she decided to do a documentary. With no prior knowledge, except my belief I knew how to convey a good story, she crisscrossed the country for two years, interviewing anyone she could find who had worked in burlesque. The result was Behind the Burly Cue. It debuted in Showtime, on Showtime in 2010. However, there was a problem. Quote, I had too many stories. They couldn't all make it into the film, so I decided to write my first book, Behind the Burly Cue published in 2013. So she became an author. She explained her interest in this way. I've always been drawn to those we label and whose stories hasn't been told. I love history and became obsessed by certain stories of certain women, usually that were once hugely famous and really were a huge influence on our pop culture, yet are forgotten today. We like to dismiss women in particular, say, stripper or freak or circus performers. No one has gone behind these labels for the women to find out who these people were. So she followed through with two more books, Goddess of Love Incarnate, The Life of Strip Two's Lily St. Cyr in 2015, and Feuding Fan Dancers in 2018. At the same time, she's made two more documentaries about forgotten women, Bound by Flesh, about conjoined sisters who became huge stars in vaudeville, and Mabel Mabel Tiger Trainer, about the world's first female tiger trainer. 
I think I skipped something that was sort of interesting, I think. Wait a minute. Oh yeah, this is where she lives. This is Holly Oaks, beautiful estate in Sycamore Canyon. Really. And the Zemeckis is also here, Castle in Tuscany, of course. And Grand and a home in Chicago. More locally, she's the founder of the program Stories Matter. Let's see if I have that. Female storytellers mentoring underserved future storytellers, which she plans on turning into a national program. She also has, if you've noticed, a book column in the weekly Montecito Journal. And she received an honor last year, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, part for, quote, sharing and preserving stories of women who were once marginalized and stigmatized. Thomas Sanchez, sometimes Thomas Sanchez. It was 1965, 21-year-old fifth-generation Californian who's living in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district with his partner, Stephanie, a painter, and their infant daughter, Dante Paloma, and working on a novel. Vehemently opposed to the Vietnam War, which he considered an immoral war, he and his family left America for Spain. He settled in a remote village in the mountains above Malaga. There he struggled, living below the poverty line for eight years, while continuing to work on what would be an epic novel rabbit boss. It was, he said, quote, about an Indian tribe that bore witness to 100 years of California's landscape being cannibalized for its timber, water, minerals, and open spaces. Upon its publication in 1973, it was hailed as one of the best novels ever to be set in California. And that is still true. He returned to the United States, renting a house in a remote village of Inverness in Sonoma County. There he finished the first longhand draft of the novel. He received a modest offer from Alfred A. Canal to publish the book, but approved enough to change his life. There were paperback sales and movie rights, and for the first time, Sanchez could live as he liked. After a year and a half in Inverness, he wanted to find a place of his own, not just any place, the one he had dreamt of from the grand epoch of dazzling Californios on vast ranches. He spent more than a half a year searching, driving 3,000 miles up and down the state, chasing any lead, traveling on the slim hope of surreptitious midnight calls from real estate sources that Nirvana just came on the market. And just as he was about to give up, he received an urgent telegram. High above the town of Santa Barbara in the San Inez Mountains of California was perhaps the embodiment of the dream. He was shown a property at the end of a rutted road off Mountain Drive. He said, I stepped out of my car a thousand feet above sea level, spread before me was a sight I'll never forget. It was a house I'd been dreaming of, nine levels of crumbled adobe walls thick as an ox leg were laid into the mountainside. Mirage from the past, the town lay distant and gloomy far below. A stage set really, conceived by an actor and mad dreamer in the 1950s. He bought it and became the owner of a marvelous adobe set on 13 acres surrounded by national forest. He dubbed it Casa Coyote. He and his wife and daughter moved in. There, he and his publisher friend, Noel Young, 
hosted the annual Waiters Stampede, semi-pagan weekend featuring barbecued pig, flamenco, and absolutely no readings from manuscript. One friend remembered them as living a Scott and Zelda existence, hosting parties with the artists and writers of the day. Perpetual flowing of ideas and libations and moonlight bathing in the swimming pool. Unfortunately, I have to make a personal one. This was before I came to Santa Barbara. I don't know whether I would have been invited, but they sound fabulous, these parties. Stampede. Santa Barbara was a perfect fit for him. He saw it as, quote, the last intact town of substance and size that still has contact with its Spanish heritage. 1973, he participated in the underground pack train running supplies to the federal free fire zone to the Indian held town of Wounded Knee. He turned down a lucrative contract to write a popular account of the conflict. Instead, he wrote an unembellished true account. He spent two years writing and making trips back to Wounded Knee. When the book was finished, the publisher said, ah, Americans no longer care. They don't want to hear about Indians. They don't want to be reminded. In 1977, the Casa was threatened by the Sycamore Canyon fire that ravaged much of Upper Montecito. Sanchez later wrote of it. In Angels Burning, Native Notes from the Land of Earthquake and Fire, published by Noah Young's Capital Press in 1987. Part of it was printed in Esquire's Flames of Santa Barbara, the Fires in Coyote Canyon. In 1978, Sanchez completed his second novel, Zoot Suit Murders, a starkly revisionist view of the American melting pot set in 1940s wartime Los Angeles. After that, he was having difficulty writing his next novel. He was given a Guggenheim Fellowship to finance it, but the money quickly ran out. In order to pay for his continued research, he rented, refinanced, and eventually, in 1986, had to sell Casa Coyote. And incidentally, though it survived the Coyote fire, in the Sycamore Canyon fire, we would not be so fortunate when the 2008 T fire swept through the canyon, destroying it in its wake. Sanchez left Santa Barbara, bouncing around Central America before landing in 1981 in Key West, Florida, America's famous southernmost continental point. It was not his intention to write a novel in Key West when he first arrived there. He had been unable to write fiction for four years. He had several hundred pages of notes and sketches for a novel set in California. But while writing both in California and in Mexico, I had been unable to, he said, to match voices to my ideas. I was like a singer who has lost his voice, standing alone on a stage, mouthing empty words for the heads of a phantom audience. There he worked intently on the novel he would title Mile Zero, and he would publish in 1989, 16 years after Rabbit Books. It was a great literary success. The LA Times calling it, quote, a magnificent tapestry, forges a new world vision, rich in cultural and literary intertextuality of Steinbeck and Cervantes. During the 90s, Sanchez lived in Paris, Provence, and New York, the settings for his fourth novel, Day of the Bees. This novel re reveals the hidden life of a woman transformed from an artist's muse into a resistance fighter. His novels were translated in French, and the French honored Sanchez as a chevalier of arts and letters for his contributions to literature. In the early 2000s, he published his fifth novel, King Bongo, set against the glamour and intrigue of 1950 Savannah. In 2013, 
he quietly returned to Montecito, working on his seventh novel, one that he had planned 50 years earlier when he was living in Casa Coyote. It is, according to his publisher, quote, a courageous adventure set in Santa Barbara during the era of historical missions and the inspiring grandeur of California wilderness. Last year, he was awarded the Penn Oakland Lifetime Achievement Award. Now, Sanchez is a very unusual writer because he refuses to have anything to do with the university and the academy. He believes that serious writers must deal with the issues of their time. He says, be warriors of their times says, why read a writer unless they have lived life, unless they have challenged themselves against life? And this is a trailblazer of two of his heroes, Jack London, John Steinbeck. They were not academics, they were out there living. And this is what Sanchez has done. Oh, I should say as a footnote, uh, strangely and terribly, uh, none of his books are in the library, the Black Gold System. That is, none of the Santa Barbara libraries have his books. Same shame. <laughs> Here's a writer of a different stripe. If you look at him, he doesn't. He looks nothing like um, Thomas Sanchez, and um, he has fallen into obscurity. He was born, I should say, he was raised in Oregon. He went to, he was a Westerner, went to the University of Idaho, where, interestingly enough, he wrote the school song, which became the official state song of Idaho. This is what he's remembered for in Idaho. None of his books, they don't know anything about that. They just know he's a guy that wrote the state song. He, after graduating, he was called to the ministry and he went to the seminary and became an Episcopal priest. Continued at Harvard, he was working on his Doctrine of Divinity. In 1932, he was 36 years old. There he met the 38-year-old Francis Lathrop Hammond at a party at her family's estate on Cape Cod. Now the Hammonds were one of the wealthiest families in Boston. Her mother, Esther Fisk Hammond, had been separated from her husband, Gardner Hammond, for many years. And she had taken a permanent residence at Bindweed, where we all know Hammond's Meadow and Hammond's estate. Francis and Helm got married in 1933, two blocks from here, to All Saints Church. But they settled in the Boston area. And they spent winters at Bonnet, beachfront property that would eventually entail 45 acres. Now, the one benefit of marrying a Hammond was he became rich. He was able to quit his teaching position and live in a style hitherto not available to him. He became fascinated with Mexican contemporary painting. In 1941, oh, by the way, this is, let me go back. This is Mrs. Hammond. She lived to a ripe old age, very athletic, great horsewoman. And actually, can't even see much of this, but they started a woman's polo team. One of these is Esther Fisk Hammond, the others are her daughters. So she was quite a character. In 1941, he published Modern Mexican Painters. This is still in print, it's the only one of his books. He would have homes in Cuernavaca, Mexico City, and San Miguel de Allende. 
This book's on Mexico, you can see here. This one, and there's several others as well as Spain. And, this, and he's a great writer because it, here's what the New York Times said of him. Helm brings to the writing task a combination of firsthand experience, sympathetic yet critical appreciation, discriminating taste and writing talent possessed by very few persons who tell about that fascinating country to the south of us. It is doubtful also that anyone has a better genius for making the hard work of good writing seem so casual, easy, and pleasant. Now, these books are all out of print, but I notice if you go on the internet, they're all available through A, B, E, or um, I'm not sure whether the library has them. Now, in 1955, Helm permanently moved to Santa Barbara. But not to Bonnie Mead. He eventually bought an estate on top of Los Alturas. It was called China Hill. It had formerly been the home of Ina Campbell, the namesake of the US, UCSB Campbell Hall. And there he would play host to um, Sunday open houses that were a much desired invitation. He also wrote a biography, as you can see to the left of um, Indipero Serra, called The Great Walker. He's from Stanford. He wrote a biography of Orozco, great muralist. He also wrote a, a biography of Roland Hayes, the great uh, African-American tenor. And he was, when he died, unfortunately, at the early age of 67, there were several books he was working on. He was a writing machine. Let me skip this. Patrick Mahoney, somebody you probably haven't heard of. I only discovered him in doing research for another book. He was born in England. Irish ancestry, something he was very proud of. His father died when he was three years old. Five years later, his mother married an American named Francis Bliss, and he was running um, Standard Oil for Rockefeller in England. In 1923, when he was 12, Bliss decided he wanted to come home to the United States and was looking for a place to settle. So they moved to the United States. He bought an estate on Schoolhouse Road in Montecito, called at the time Paradero, later renamed Tara. I, I shouldn't say to clarify the name Bliss here, you might think it's, he, has, he has some connection to um, the Bliss, the owners of Casa de Linda, but he, he's not related at all. I think it's you know, just about around the block, coincidentally. And Mahoney said of Santa Barbara, oh, by the way, Mahoney is quite a wit, sort of in the uh, Oscar Wilde colored type, scintillating, caustic. He said, Montecito's a paradise. In summer, the sea lies like a mirror under the vast serenity of the Pacific sky. The beaches have their quota of sun worshipers who lie about like sea lions, gazing on the void of the ocean. Most people here in those faraway days live with their backs turned to the rest of the world. He had a long career as a writer and as a lecturer. And during the war years, um, he became secretary to Morris Maeterlinck, who was a famous Belgian writer, who won the Nobel Prize. And afterwards, after the war, he wrote the official biography of Maeterlinck. It's a name is pretty much forgotten. But he gained some real notoriety around here. 1957, 
He published his only novel, Breath of Scandal. These were about dark dunes and sunny places. A good deal of the novel takes place in a place he called San Benito, but it's so obviously in Montecito that it fooled nobody. And people recognize themselves in there and were very, very upset about the book. And so much so that he had to leave town. He ended up going to Carmel. There was a headline in the paper down there about Santa Barbara author forced to leave town. And um, finally, he was able to come back, but people never really forgave him for this book. No, unfortunately, the book uh, is pretty hard to find, but it's pretty amusing. And then he also wrote maybe 10 years later a play uh, that, that played in Los Angeles and based on the same characters. You know, all these Santa Barbara people went down there to see who he was talking about, who were the characters. Um, he finally ended up living in Los Angeles in the hills and he would host great parties. He was part of the um, elite group of intellectuals years. That's the famous book right there, very aptly titled. Well, this is Charles B. Nora. If you know your history of Santa Barbara, you've heard of Charles Nora, his grandfather. He was a journalist in New York that came out to California to really publicize how great California was and what a wonderful place it was for people that were sick or ailing because of the sunny climate and the wonderful temperature, especially in Southern California, excuse me. And he had special praise for Santa Barbara. This resulted, this book was written in the 1880s. In um, 1880, of people coming from the Northeast to Santa Barbara who were sick and they wanted to get better, take the healing of the hot springs, be here. And this is really what started all the great hotels in Arlington and Potter. In fact, he was so, um, much appreciated that in uh, the Ojai Valley, the town was called Nordoff because the um, owner of a big hotel there, which was essentially the town, came out here because of the book. Well, what happened in World War I, because uh, Nordoff was a German, a German name, and there was so much feeling against Germans, and they changed it to Ojai. Associators of Nordoff High School. His father, the son of Charles Nordoff, Walter Nordoff, was also a writer. He lived in Santa Barbara in the 30s and he worked for 10 years on a novel set in um, Baja, California, called The Journey of the Flame. And that book is now considered a California classic. Unfortunately, hard to find. But Charles, he attended, this Charles B, we'll call him, he attended Kate School. When the war broke out, and I, and I mean World War I, he went to Europe, learned how to fly, and joined the famous Lafayette Escadrilles. There he met another father named James Hall. After the war, they traveled, he and Hall, and ended up in Tahiti. He married twice, serially, and at the same time, to Native women and 10 children. 
Yes. Very prolific. He wrote Mutiny and the Bounty, which of course was, the, it says, the greatest sea story of all time. And, um, and it became, there were two sequels, so it became the Bounty Trilogy. And here we, and this, and in the center of the picture on the typewriter is uh, Nordoff and that's Hall on the right. So after, and of course there was the 1935 movie adaptation, which is a classic in itself, Clark Gable and Charles Lawton. Anyway, he divorced his second wife and in 1941 moved back to California. Married a woman here 25 years his junior, finally settling in Santa Barbara where his parents were living. First, he went to Hope Ranch. And a few years later, he sold his home to another writer, well known in his day, but forgotten today, named Edwin Cole. And they moved to East Valley Road. That's how he gets in this lecture, because he was living in Montecito. The newspaper once had a profile of him and said that in semi-retirement, he lived here so quietly that few townspeople knew of his presence. Unfortunately, he developed cataracts. His sight was nearly gone and he was supposed to undergo a rather critical operation. He was subject to depressions and heavy drinking. In 1947, he committed suicide. It so it happened that Hall was in the United States at the time. He attended the funeral in Santa Barbara and was said to have wept disconsolately over the fate of his friend. You know, I'm skipping a few people because um, I just don't have time. It's only 15 minutes left. But I do want to talk about this character. Douglas Adams. With the publication in 1978 of his first novel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a 26-year-old English comic writer, Douglas Adams' career took off like, well, like a rocket became an international multimedia phenomenon, spawned four more novels, the first of what would become a five-part trilogy. In 1999, Adams, then 49 years old, his wife, Jane, and five-year-old daughter, Polly Jane Rocket Adams, moved from London to Santa Barbara. He said he needed to be on the coast, not so much, according to his biographer, a location as a state of mind, having nothing to do with the seaside, but everything to do with Hollywood. Because finally, after several decades of false starts and uncertain flirtations, it appeared as if the film version of Hitchhiker was finally going to be made. Adam said that the initial move was harder than he expected. Quote, I've only recently understood how opposed to the move Mark was. Though he would later say that he would recommend it to anyone in the depths of middle age, just upping sticks and going somewhere else. You reinvent your life and just start again. It's invigorating. His wife finally came around and enjoyed it, though she did suffer, according to a friend, the long-term prisoners called gate fever. One Adam's biography states that she observed that sometimes it could be a bit of step wise. Quote, the affluent cosmetically adjusted locals with those teeth that only Americans and people in television seem to manage. The Potemkin supermarkets with their rows of shiny technicolored fruit, tasting of nothing, and the endless days of dappled sunshine all contrived to give the place a certain unreality in her mind. They were both delighted that Polly took to California with delight. A friend later remembered a visit with Adams. 
our afternoon stroll along butterfly beaches, wintry beach, punctuated by running races with his then six-year-old daughter. I had never seen them so happy, and I had no inkling that this time together would be our last. He found a home in the Hedgerow area of Montecito, which Adams described as a verdant village of Hymenesque gated enclaves, huge houses looking like escapees from the set of Dallas. Nevertheless, he did succumb to the Montecito lifestyle. He loved cars, especially finely engineered luxury autos such as Lexus or Mercedes. He indulged himself by buying a black Mercedes 500, which he would tool around the village. In April 2001, he gave a talk at UCSB where he told a local interviewer he had been very keen to do one here, just sort of to say, hi, here I am. Now, an important part of his routine was working out with his personal trainer, Peter Park, at Platinum Fitness, a private facility on Middle Road off of Coast Village Road. Their park would put Adams through a routine that had been wise for him. Friday, May 11, 2001, resting from his regular workout, he laid motionless on a bench. Park called an ambulance, was taken to Cottage Hospital, he never regained consciousness. He had suffered cardiac arrest as a result of undiagnosed coronary artery disease. His wife said that his heart had just stopped like one of his beloved computers failing to reboot. His funeral was held in Santa Barbara five days later. Excuse me while I sip some tea. Now, this Christopher Buckley is not the better known Christopher Buckley, the son of uh, William F. Buckley and the novelist. But this Christopher Buckley, if you don't know him, and you should, is certainly the greatest poet to come out of Montecito or Santa Barbara for that matter. He's the author of more than 20 books of poetry. His work has appeared widely in periodicals, including the New Yorker. He's a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in Poetry, two National Endowment of Arts for the Grants, one of the awards. He's an emeritus professor of creative writing at the University of California at Riverside. And the important thing is he is a true local. He came here as a tiny child. His father worked at a local radio station, KTMS, and he lived with his family in modest homes all over Montecito, Humphrey Road, Picacho Lane, Alisos Drive, Schoolhouse Road, to name a few. His father liked to buy and flip houses. <clears throat> now Buckley attended local parochial schools, Lady of Mount Carmel and Bishop Diego High School before going on to St. Mary's College and then an MA at San Diego State and an MFA at UC Irvine. When he retired from teaching, he came back to Santa Barbara and he lives there today quietly on the Mesa, occasionally teaching poetry workshops at the College of Creative Studies at UCSB. Now his poetry is wonderful, but what might interest us locals the most is his memoir trilogy. Beginning with Cruising State, was in 1994, continuing in Sleepwalk, California Dreamin' and the Last Dance with the Sixties, and Holy Days of Obligation, Essays on Santa Barbara in 2014. These chronicle his Montecito boyhood, one preoccupied with surfing, tennis, and cars. 
a charmingly vocal lost era and a must read for anyone interested in Montecito of the 50s and 60s. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a few quotes. Montecito was a suburb of Santa Barbara. And altogether, it was a slow and sleepy place, two hours up the Pacific Coast Highway from LA. We spent a lot of time by the beach, and the main attraction in Montecito for those tourists who did find us was the Miramar Hotel, where really anyone can walk on the boardwalk and beach and use the facilities reserved for hotel guests who had paid to escape Los Angeles. I went often with my friends and rode the waves on rafts, swam out to the float the hotel provided about 50 yards offshore. There was also a tennis court we used, and no one ever checked to see the guests. Again, I was alive and lost in the suburbs of Santa Barbara. Other than soda fountains and black and white films from the 40s, the only one I'd seen was in Montecito Village. Small group of shops just up the intersection of San Isidro and East Valley, the two main roads into our woodsy enclave. The southwest corner was taken up with the YMCA, a two story wooden building the color of driftwood with basketball standards and courts in the back. Across from the Y, San Isidro Pharmacy and Fire Station, a standard oil filling station as my father still called them, and a horseshoe drive that looped toward the foothills and back, with the Isaiah Brothers Market at the top, a grocery store where everything seemed 15% better than anything at the Giordano's markets in Santa Barbara. The service, the tomatoes, the ground round, the meat car, and a place where it all costs 30% more. Around the loop, there was a bookshop on the right side, a branch library, an art frame shop, and on the other side, coming down, a small post office, some realtors, and other offices. This was the blueprint, the world day to day, my life, its repetition, the daily confirmation of my place on earth, which had yet to change. I really recommend. Uh, these books to anybody. They're all available and they're great in the Montecito nostalgia. You know, I'm going to have to stop here because it's five to six. <laughs> and I have much more uh, to talk about. You know, I'm going to do a quick one. I'm going to have to skip. Um... Steve, do you want to do? Um... A few questions before we wrap up. Yeah, why don't we do that? If, if okay. we I think um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom, um, or it's on the bottom of my screen. And if you, if you send in a question, I think we'll see it there. And that timer thing is back. <laughs> Questions, please. Oh, I see Bill Valero raised his hand. I think I can let you talk. Hold on a sec. Okay, I think I you can unmute yourself, Bill, if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, Steve. Hi, um, Bill. I'm. Let me get rid of the screen. Good. Um, of the people you didn't talk about. <laughs> the top of your head who's most interesting other well, people i did not talk about yeah give us another name or two well i have uh, robert robert maynard hutchins you know him yes center for the study of democratic institutions right. as so we're going to talk about that i was going to talk about gordon forbes who wrote uh, another scandalous book too near the sun um kenneth rexroth great poet lived over here, right down the street, actually. Um, uh, John Sanford, uh, 
amazing writer, his wife, Marguerite Roberts. Um, Great. God, I mean, that could go on. I mean, I would say there, I probably, I could probably do a, a third and fourth installment. <laughs> okay. Is there a particular writer you were interested in? No, just wonderful news to have those names and know about you. Yeah, but you know, what I'm going to do though, is I'm going to turn all of this into a book mm -hmm. uh, of Montecito writers. So I'll have all of these people in more depth and everybody else that was left out. Um, and, and I keep hearing about more of them. So uh, we'll do that. You know, although I know another one I wanted to include was um, Neville Kramer, who wrote Montecito Boy, hmm. and um, David Myrick, who wrote The History of Montecito. And uh, there's several other novelists. So they keep coming. The hills and valleys of Montecito are alive with the sound of clacking typewriters. So who knows? Um, and uh, I will look up your bibliography too. So, oh, you know, I have to admit that um, when Kim said that I wrote 20 books, mm -hmm. I did not write 20 books. That, that would have been, um, even in my um, long years on this planet, would have been quite an effort. Most of my books were anthologies and collections. So I put them together. I mean, there was some effort there, but it wasn't like writing a novel, which could take years. Uh, I've actually written this last book I wrote about um, Santa Barbara writers. Uh, it was actually a real book written. Everything else are collections. Many of them about Santa Barbara. Anyway, what a treat. I couldn't get in earlier and Kim got me in and I much appreciate it. So. You got a slipper of 20, she'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a last minute, like not, for other people too, like a last minute dash people trying to get in. So. And I wish I could have, pardon me? Thanks so much. You're welcome. Hope to meet you sometime. Down at the library. I'm around, see me walking around. I'm right. right. <laughs> now you know what I look like. So. Right, right. Thank you. Well, I wanted to say thank you. I don't know if we have other questions. We have a couple comments. Um, someone said, excellent presentation. Love ya. Mm -hmm. Someone that you know. <laughs> and then it's someone else said, great presentation. I think a third installment would be well worth doing. Oh, you know what I wanted to, wait a minute. Oh, these were some other things that I was going to, oh, there you go. Oh. Uh, if you want, you can contact me at this email address if you have any questions, comments. Oh, I think I think the screen shares. What what is it, Steve? I'll type it in the chat so people can see. SG.skywriter at gmail.com. Great. Yeah. So there's Steve's email. Oh, and someone another person has a question. I'm gonna turn, see if you'd like to speak. Oh, actually, oops, I just did something. Oh, maybe her hand went down. Okay, I don't see her hand up anymore. Maybe she changed her mind. Well, I answered everybody's questions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe her question was. Answered, right? um, well, that wraps up the presentation for this evening. Um, I wanted to thank Steve for being so generous in, with your time and um, agreeing to do this talk for us. Very. Uh, fun to learn about our local history and just really fun to work with you throughout this whole process. So Thanks, Kim. It's I, I've enjoyed it's it a lot. Great. Yeah, thank you. And thank You're you to everyone for joining. You're a librarians everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Kim, I didn't, I didn't get his email address. It's oh, S okay. sg.skywriter sg at gmail.com. Skywriter. S-K-Y-W-R-I-T-E-R. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.